Good evening and welcome. My name is Stephanie Vlack and I'm an assistant professor of the physical education, fitness and sports studies department here at the College of DuPage. Thank you so much for joining this evening's discussion on food is money, the economics of nutrition. As you are aware, the pandemic coupled with the economic crisis has impacted food pantry distribution and donations. It has also challenged students, families, and seniors to sustain adequate nutrition. Tonight, we will discuss the link between food insecurity, health and economics, and changes that can positively impact the community. Our panelists tonight include Dr. Janet Milliken, registered dietitian and past president of the West Suburban Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, Maureen heffern Ponicky, Assistant Professor of Political Science at the College of DuPage, Christina LePage, Senior Director of Programs for People's Resource Center, Anna Vitek, Manager of the Fuel Garden here at the College of DuPage, Remick Enzweiler, Manager of the Natural Areas of the College of DuPage, and Shafali Chavedi, Executive Director of Giving DuPage. This presentation is provided in partnership with Addison Public Library, the Bellwood Public Library, the Glenside Public Library, and the Wheaton Public Library. Before we begin, I just have a few housekeeping notes to remind. All participants are muted with videos off. Please submit questions in the Q&A box. Our panelists will have time to take questions at the end of their discussion. The participant chat is open, but will not be moderated. This presentation is being recorded and will be archived for future viewing on the college's website at www.cod.edu backslash experts. It will also be on the COD YouTube channel. We will begin tonight's discussion with Dr. Janet Milliken. She is a dietitian who works closely with communities, families, and individuals in both clinical and outpatient settings to develop healthy eating initiatives for both adults and children. Her presentation will focus on the impact school lunches have on the national economy. Welcome, Janet. Thank you so much, everyone, for participating and happy National Nutrition Month for those of you who aren't dietitians and don't know that. I begin our discussion tonight with an overview of K through 12 school meal programming, which has its roots in student food insecurity and move on briefly to discuss food insecurity faced by college students today. And this supports the learning objectives listed on this slide. School, schools across America depend on viable, affordable food service programs to fuel young minds and bodies for learning. We want to set children up for success in the classroom and by making sure that they are fed is one way to do that. The history of government supported school food meal, school meals began with the Richard Russell Act of 1946 that was signed by President Truman. This legislation included the provision for school lunches for children who are required by law to be in school. Legislation has been modified throughout the years making changes to programs feeding children. In 1975, the National School Breakfast Program was added to programming. And then in 1994, Dietary Guidelines for Meals was added as an accountability measure for food components provided within the school um, food meal programs. And then in 2010, the Hunger Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act was a reauthorization of school meal programs. Legislative efforts recognize that students have a, those students that have a lack of access to food. It's important to understand that the US government defines food insecurity based on hunger. Food insecurity is thought to have a negative impact on health outcomes and learning with research supporting that there is an increased risk for numerous maladies such as those shown on this slide. And we know that kids sitting in classrooms are hungry, it's harder to concentrate and learn. The U.S. Department of Agriculture supports government programs to combat hunger and insecurity on multiple fronts. The Food and Nutrition Service arm of the USDA is responsible for numerous nutrition assistance programs. 
Most recognizable are SNAP, which is out of the old food stamp program, and WIC. Tonight, we focus on school meal programs under SNAP. Families qualify for school meal assistance under the SNAP guidelines, and then schools meet specific requirements to qualify for reimbursement of those meals that they serve. Moody Analytics estimates that in a weak economy, $1 in SNAP benefits generates about $1.70 in economic activity. Food service providers document program information, and this allows the government to generate data and keep track of spending and make modifications along the way. The next two slides give a national overview of the scope of children served by the National School Meal Programs and provides insight into food insecurity of children. The data is from 2019, so that's pre-pandemic. Students, students served are receiving either free school meals, discounted or full price meals. The National School Lunch Programs in, in 2019 served close to 5 billion school lunches annually. The school breakfast programs are a little smaller in number, but they served close to 2.5 billion breakfasts annually. I think this picture is worth a thousand words showing lines for free food in a uh, food bank in Texas. People who have never needed food assistance are flocking to food banks and other sources of free food during the pandemic. We just reviewed how many students are served daily through school food programs. Because of the infrastructure in place within these programs, many districts have been able to continue to serve students their meals. When everything shut down, school food service leaders needed to come up with a plan to figure out how to keep school children fed, even though they were not in school. There was no playbook or disaster plan for these types of events. Initially, the USDA allowed food service providers to make adjustments in districts and get meals out. And over time, legislation has caught up to start meeting the challenge of feeding students in their new learning environments and increase the funding and support. National waivers provide flexibility for school food service in terms of where and when students are fed, as well as meal content flexibility. To go from the cafeteria to curbside, overnight, many adjustments needed to be made. And that had a financial impact on school district budgets. K through 12 schools that are a part of a coordinated school meal program adapted to a major disruption and were able to feed food insecure students and keep people employed. The ongoing ability to plan is financially beneficial to the districts. We can appreciate that just because someone turns 18 and goes to college doesn't mean their food insecurity disappears. Collecting information about food insecurity among college students is difficult. The Government Accountability Office's 2015 report collected information from 14 colleges and two to four year at two and four year colleges and universities to shine some light on the topic of food insecurity. And they found that there is ongoing food insecurity after high school. College students lack understanding about food assistance through the federal programs. And some colleges have instituted programs to assist food insecure students, such as educating people on campus, providing extra classes, in, including food pantries and other provisions allowing for emergency aid to be given to students, as well as studying students on campus to understand their needs. But we already know that the landscape and need has changed due to COVID-19. The ability to pivot in the way K through 12 did not, in the way that K through 12 did, is not available in the college framework. Some national polling suggests one third of students are food insecure during the pandemic. Various states are pursuing legislative action for hunger-free campuses, and students' need for food assistance is real. Because each campus is unique, ongoing work is necessary to understand college students' needs. How that is being done locally will be addressed by our other speakers. I thank COD for allowing me to participate tonight and highlight that dietitians have a role to play in food service environments. We are a diverse profession with numerous and unique skill sets that are working in a variety of clinical and food service settings. Thank you so much for your time and I will turn it back over to you.
<laughs> yep. Thank you, Janet. I, that was um, really, really important information. I'm sure we're going to have some audience questions after our discussion, for sure. Um, next, I'm going to turn the discussion over to Professor Heffern Panicki, and she will address the cost to society of inadequate nutrition. Prior to pursuing a career in teaching, Assistant Professor Maureen Heffern Panicki worked in the nonprofit sector, both at the grassroots and at the policy level. Maureen. Thank you. Good evening, everyone, and happy St. Patrick's Day, first of all. Um, I thought I would open with a quote from Professor Reddy, who is the president of the Public Health Foundation of India, who wisely stated, quote, although the price of addressing malnutrition can be huge, evidence shows that the cost of doing nothing is immeasurably greater, end quote. But that was um, an apt quote for this evening. So let's take a step back and look at what are these costs. Um, and unfortunately, as uh, Dr. Milliken began, this is bad news in terms of lost economic growth, lost investment in human capital, premature child and adult mortality. In fact, 45% of, this is globally, 45% of preventable child deaths are associated with poor nutrition. Cognitive impairment, reduced learning potential, poor school performance, reduced labor productivity, increased healthcare costs, increased public sector costs such as criminal justice and uh, the need for public benefits. This is all not to mention the enormous moral question of leaving many without nutrition on a globe that is equipped to sustain all. So let me start a little with the global story and then as a group we'll come closer and closer to home. So to begin, as we all know, COVID has been devastating in our fight against hunger and poverty. COVID-19 is expected to push 150 million more people into extreme poverty, measured as living less on less than $1.90 a day. Again, this is global. This would be the first increase in extreme poverty in 20 years. Globally, we were making progress on ending global poverty by the year 2030. That will not likely happen. From 1990 until 2015, global poverty was dropping by 1% a year and the pandemic has halted that progress. So now zoning a little bit um, on the United States, it's a similar story in that prior to the pandemic, poverty had been declining in America with the lowest poverty rate on record went since we've measured since 1959 at 10.5%. Childhood poverty was also at its lowest uh, pre-pandemic. And then as we all know, 74.7 .7 million jobs lost since the start of the pandemic. The majority of those lost jobs are in below average wages. Uh, 24 million American adults experiencing hunger. The pandemic, as has been much discussed, has disproportionately hurt already low income earners. In fact, billionaires' wealth has grown during the pandemic by 36%, and yet approximately 20% of children are hungry. So we, we've talked a lot about this, but it's worth saying again, our existing inequalities are being cemented and worsened, and it is a wake-up call. Americans in the top 5% of income earners tend to live nine years longer than those in the bottom 10% of income earners, and that was pre-pandemic. Some estimates at quantifying the cost uh, to the U.S. of child poverty put the cost at 500 billion annually. That's lost productivity, higher healthcare costs, increased criminal justice spending, et cetera. So poverty affects us all. I wanna shine a light on one of the strongest connections in the research literature, and that is the connection between human capital and economic growth. What do we mean by human capital? It means the skills, both the hard and the soft skills, education, and the capacity of an individual. And as human capital rises, especially when measured by years of schooling, economic growth rises. It is a very strong connection in the research uh, literature. It's even stronger in the knowledge economy, which is increasingly growing as a percent of jobs. So when kids suffer poor nutrition, they fall into poverty, they risk leaving school, and not going to college, it puts the entire region's economic growth in significant jeopardy. So what to do? We do know that policy makes a huge impact, but policy demands political will. Research shows that the biggest policies that reduce poverty are job creation, 
minimum wage increases, investment in childcare and early childhood education, and paid leave and paid sick days that allow low-income earners to keep jobs despite sickness and family emergencies. Researchers estimate that if it were not for the first coronavirus relief package, the CARES Act that was passed in April 2020, that instead of poverty ending at 13.9%, it would have jumped to 19.4%. So 18 million people were estimated to been, have been saved from poverty due to that federal plan. And after the unemployment benefits expired in July, poverty had bounced back up to 17.3%. As you all know, a $1.9 trillion coronavirus rescue plan just uh, recently passed. It includes tax credits, expanded unemployment, rental assistance, food aid, health insurance subsidies, and a child credit. Some estimates say that it will cut the child credit alone will cut poverty, uh, child poverty in half. We in the US have one of the highest child poverty rates in the developed world. Um, economists also project that the package will cut poverty overall by a third, getting 13 million people out of poverty and significantly boost economic growth. Now, as you might be thinking, economists and politicians are divided on whether this package was a wise idea or not. On the one hand, evidence shows that when you get money to the lowest income earners, you get the biggest gain in economic growth. Why? Because they spend the money as opposed to high income earners who save it. But indeed, worries do exist about the threat to inflation and increased deficit spending. So the debate wages on what can you do? Uh, one, learn. Do exactly what you are doing this evening, coming here, attending events like this, because only with an informed citizenry can we effectively and collectively meet a massive pro uh, public problem like uh, poverty and food insecurity, and then act. And we will talk about uh, multiple ways this evening to do that. Um, but poverty used to be predominantly located in cities and not in suburbs, and yet that has been changing faster than we are often able to mount a response. Increasingly low income and poor residents are found across US cities and suburbs, and this presents a significant challenge for suburban jurisdictions. So lastly, I'll just end on a positive, um, hopeful note, time and time again, we have confronted massive challenges and we have collectively met those challenges. Research evidence also shows that when we do it collectively, so when there is collaboration between government, colleges and universities, nonprofits and the business community, it results in a more effective economic bounce back from crisis. So there is ample evidence and hope that we can do the same when it comes to food insecurity. Thank you. Thank you, Maureen. That was absolutely eye-opening for sure. Um, next, Christina LePage will be explaining how food pantries are adapting to new needs since COVID-19, since um, inadequate nutrition is just one concern of local food pantries. As Senior Director of Programs for the People's Resource Center, Christina LePage oversees the coordination and delivery of services that reach nearly 25,000 clients each year. Christina also convenes the DuPage Community Hunger Network working to address food security in DuPage County. Welcome, Christina. Thank you, Stephanie, and good evening, everyone. And I just want to start by saying thank you to College of DuPage for creating this opportunity um, for People's Resource Center to share kind of this, this perspective as part of this discussion. Um, so welcome to People's Resource Center. Um, our mission since 1975 has been to respond to basic human needs and to do that in a way that really promotes dignity, respect and justice and, and at the core is creating a future of hope and opportunity for DuPage County residents. So as you can imagine this past year, that mission has been even more critical as we've kind of risen to the challenge to respond to the changing needs. Um, so although my presentation tonight is going to focus primarily on our food pantry, I do want to share that PRC offers this whole array of services. We really try to be as comprehensive as possible in addition to those basic needs that we respond to having an array of empowerment services as well. So in addition to food pantry, we have a social service team that responds to 
requests for emergency financial assistance. We have a closed closet. We offer computer training and computer access. We have an art studio. Um, we have services under our adult learning and literacy programming and job search assistance as well. So although I'll focus, like I said, on the food pantry, everything in the past year had to be changed and adapted to continue to meet the needs we were seeing across the county. So um, PRC is all about neighbors to neighbors. So as we just kind of paint that picture, we heard the previous two presenters talk kind of that global perspective. In DuPage County, as, as you know, the pandemic was beginning to hit, I mean, we were at an all time low um, for unemployment, a rate of 2.6% in DuPage County, um, which quickly shot up to 15% uh, in April, 2020. Um, we were looking at a food uh, insecurity rate in DuPage, you know, of about 5.6 percent, um, you know, impacting over 55,000 individuals um, who were dealing with hunger. This is, again, before kind of going fully into the pandemic. So Feeding America, again, the National Organization of Food Banks was projecting by December 2020, you know, we'd be looking at an 80 percent increase to food insecurity rates in DuPage or jumping up to about 10.6 percent. So so again, in real time, and I love how um, Janet had shared, you know, there was no playbook for this. <laughs> so we were all in real time having to change and adapt um, again to meet the needs as, as they were coming to us. Um, and again, this it takes a village uh, to do this massive modified operation. So as PRC was going through this, all 53, you know, the food pantries in DuPage County were figuring out how are we going to continue to meet the needs and, and do so in a way that supported the safety of our clients, our volunteers, our staff. Um, so thankfully, you know, with in DuPage, the DuPage Community Hunger Network, um, that I have the pleasure of, of being a convener of that group, you know, we were able to continue to put our heads together, look at trends and what's working for you and how do we, you know, apply that here? Um, we truly leaned on each other to be able to get through this. Um, so that was that was key. Here, I tried to really boil down a timeline to capture these major milestones of change that occurred at PRC. And again, this is just our food pantry. Um, so we had to make some hard decisions in March, and we're at a, a year to the date, you know, of looking at a year of this. Um, but March was very pivotal for our organization. I mean, prior to COVID, you know, we had offered 13 food distribution shifts, rapidly looking at how do we keep people safe, work within our limited space, and still serve the community. We reduced to six distributions at our locations, um, Wheaton and Westmont. Um, we had to make the decision to temporarily pause our school-based food pantry, We Go Market in West Chicago. Chicago. Um, by June, we were looking at some targeted approaches for expanding home delivery to senior um, apartment buildings. Um, by July, we fortunately were able to learn from those two months and bring back to uh, food distributions in Wheaton and Westmont and also had formed a new partnership um, with St. Andrew's Church that had risen to the challenge to respond to the needs in West Chicago and were, were willing to work with us to, to really double the efforts to serve that community. Um, other things besides food, we adapted our back to school program and served over a thousand children to meet their school supply needs. By October, we looked at how we could shift from a two visit a month um, for our clients and changing that to weekly just to minimize any other barriers getting in the way of people accessing food when they needed it. Um, November, we were testing uh, virtual. We wanted, we didn't want to lose the nutrition piece. Um, and so two big things, um, you know, one being bringing back our healthy lifestyle nutrition workshops virtually and uh, offering a home delivery produce box with that program um, and being able to test how we could still do a choice model with our curbside approach and bring back a limited shopping list that we could try to better meet the needs of our clients. By December, again, non-food, but important, our holiday giving program adapted that to serve over 1,700 children um, and then had a great opportunity for a partnership with the Northern Illinois Food Bank um, to be able to test their technology around online ordering um, and their food system um, to see how we could adapt some of that. And by January, we were able to reopen our WeGo market in West Chicago and again, continue that effort um, with St. Andrew's Church to, to continue to serve the amazing need we were seeing within that specific community. So again, these are kind of hitting the high notes with everything else going on in our organization to adapt, respond, and 
and do that. And it was because of our amazing staff, our volunteers and the community around us that lifted us up to be able to um, achieve this amazing amount of change in such a short period of time. So in this year, um, we served um, over 5,100 households. Um, that's about 17,000 individuals. Um, we were able to provide, so we measure in, in like the food box or food cart. Um, so that's 41,000 um, food carts that went out in that period of time. Um, what this doesn't capture in those unduplicated households are the numbers in West Chicago. So because that was a very rapid response, we were measuring and just counting the bare minimum amount of data of households and individuals. And, and on average, um, there since July, they're serving around 350 households in a Saturday distribution. Our social services team responded to over 3,600 phone calls as well in that time for emergency uh, services. So again, the needs are changing. They continue to change rapidly. Again, choice uh, for food choices continues to be at the core and a top priority um, for People's Resource Center and all of the food pantries in our county and looking at creative ways that we can continue to respond to um, make sure that people have access to healthy choices and, and good nutritional options, um, that we're meeting cultural and religious needs around food. All of those different pieces continue to be critical. Um, barriers, you know, as we look at this new piece and living in a world with COVID, you know, the health and safety aspects of how we continue to provide food access in safe ways, um, but also just the stigma. So many people were thrown into a position of needing to access a food pantry that they never had. They never had to do that before. So how do we continue to address stigma, continue to break down those barriers to make it as easy as possible to get the support that people need when they need it? Um, and looking at technology, huge opportunities with technology. Um, again, when it's looking at making our services as accessible as possible from that point of new client registration, and also these opportunities in front of us of exploring online ordering is very exciting. And again, how can we uphold just dignity, respect, and make accessing services as easy and convenient as possible? And then lastly, we had a really neat opportunity in partnership with College of DuPage. They had asked our art program if they could collaborate on a kids art challenge to um, have children ac across DuPage County kind of share their interpretation of healthy food and what that means to them. So I wanna, to in closing, share one of those submissions. Um, I think it's a beautiful image of, of what healthy food meant to this child. And it also kind of leaves us with the fact that we need to continue to look at creative ways, innovative ways to make sure that we're making it as easy as possible for our community to access food when they need it. So again, a collaborative effort we couldn't do it without our amazing team at PRC and the support from the community, all the other food pantries that are working alongside um, with this very important effort. So again, I really appreciate the opportunity to be able to share that with you this evening. Thank you. Christi Christina, thank you so much. You and the People's Resource Center, you're doing amazing, amazing work for the community. Um, I'm now going to hand the discussion over to Anna Vitek and Remick Ellensweiler. And they are going to describe how COD is tackling food insecurity on campus. Um, involved in the college's answer to student food insecurity, Anna Vitek manages the fuel garden at the College of DuPage. The garden supplements the campus fuel pantry, providing fresh organically grown produce for pantry clients. Working with the fuel garden and the local community garden initiatives, Remick Enzweiler manages 40 acres of outdoor lab space, prairie, and natural areas on the COD campus. Welcome, Anna and Remick. Hi, everyone. Uh, I am super excited to introduce you all to the Field Garden Project at the College of DuPage. The Field Garden grows organic produce to help fight food insecurity in the COD community. And we are gardening year round, which is uh, wonderful. We have 13 beds total at the Field Garden site. They were built in 2019, and you can see them there at the left on a nice sunny day uh, in June of last year. Uh, we have the three aquaponic towers in the greenhouse for winter production where we can grow leafy uh, salad greens um, over winter in particular, but you can kind of see them in that middle shot. And then this spring we just planted over to the right. Uh, that's our early spring uh, crops are in the high tunnel in collaboration with the horticulture department. So we have about 20 crops out there of early spring cold weather veggies growing right now. 
So plants are started from a uh, seed to ensure the best quality. We select the best cultivars for our climate and garden, and then we nurture them from seed all the way to harvest, growing them organically, using organic fertilizers and pest management tools. At left there is the cabbage crop going out last spring. And then at right are our garden interns this spring uh, planting uh, for this spring, like getting ready to plant all of the seedlings they're doing. They've done a lot in the last couple of weeks. So our goal is to provide fresh veggies weekly. Um, how were we running before the campus shut down? We had a weekly on-campus produce market. We featured the aquaponic crops in winter as salad kits and stir fry kits. And the garden market table was run by the field garden student interns. You can see a, a table set up from last year, pre-shutdown. And then in the middle, that's like one of our Mediterranean salad kits we are distributing. And again, we are doing this weekly. So then in June, uh, we uh, had to switch. It took us a little while to switch over to a uh, farm to pantry curbside model. Uh, there are, uh, and I've got some shots from last June. That's our uh, cabbage and carrots and uh, everything getting ready at harvest. Our interns harvesting in the middle shot. And then I did include a uh, shot of what a pantry pickup looked like last November. This was our Thanksgiving uh, market pickup on the curb at COD. So back to the harvest in the garden. What, uh, what, did, what did we grow last year? We were, uh, had a really great harvest. We harvested over 842 pounds in 2020. That's from uh, early January to December, our last outdoor harvest, um, over 50 crops grown. Again, this is a three season outdoor organic gardening and a very uh, dense planting plan. So spring crops, then rotating to summer crops, then rotating to fall crops. And all of that brought directly to the pantry curbside pickup. And then we switched the aquaponic crops in winter. Um, and just some shots of our beautiful uh, harvest below, all of the peppers, garlic, onions, uh, summer squash in the middle and a, a really good zucchini and Egyptian onions and our potato crops. Some of the examples of the crops we're bringing to market. So uh, what are the benefits of locally grown organic food? Number one for us, the taste. Locally grown food might not have the uniform look of supermarket food, but it has superior and fresher flavor which is important. Number two, it, the health benefits. Organic gardens are free from pesticides and toxic chemicals. We keep the field garden organic as much as possible. Then uh, it's fresher. Locally grown food doesn't get shipped great distances and it's fresher and higher in nutrient value. It has peak nutrient density when consumed right after harvest. And number four, environment. Locally grown food that doesn't use chemicals or synthetic fertilizers is simply put better for the environment Small animals, butterflies, birds, pollinators are unharmed. And we are turning our organic waste into compost, which means less waste in the landfills. So some of our ongoing collaborations to share, we have ongoing uh, collaborations with the culinary department to create preserved food from the garden. Some examples of food preservation using garden veggies include tomato sauce pictured at left from last year. Uh, we've done soups, a veggie chili, all with culinary. And we've also done a Prairie Tea fundraiser with natural areas in, on campus. And that uh, is pictured off to the right. And the middle shot is that our harvest uh, going to make that jar of marinara sauce on the left. So now I'm gonna turn a little bit to some data uh, from the pantry side of the project. Um, and you can see on the chart in the middle of the page, number of clients per month since curb, curbside distribution opened last year and the need going up as the year progressed and then how we are right now in February. So since opening for curbside distribution, the fuel pantry has served 245 unique clients in 533 visits and provided over 16,000 pounds of food and supported over additional 700 additional family members of clients through these food distributions. Um, and then in February, you can see right there in the first three weeks of February, the field pantry provided 3,607 pounds of food. And in just February, we've seen 75 new clients. I also wanted to share some of what we're hearing from curbside. Uh, and I will read you uh, two of these quotes that we've received. I wanted to send a huge thank you on behalf of my family. During these times, I've struggled financially due to job loss, but the changes of the Fully remote for each member of my household has taken an emotional toll on us too. Your help with food was unimaginable. 
The service that came along with the donations of food and goods was unexpected. I thank you for the experience. It, it wasn't easy asking for help, yet you were there for me, no questions asked. And another one, I just wanted to tell you from the bottom of my heart that I appreciate the service you provided. I want you to know that you are so kind and that by starting things like this to help others is such a wonderful thing. My parents always provided for me, but I married someone who brought me down and I left. It has not been easy. I wanted you to know that I thank each and every one of your volunteers for their time and their kindness. And with that, like uh, a short overview, I, I hope uh, I gave you an overview of the project itself. There's some more shots of our beautiful harvest from last season and all the produce we grow. And with that, I'll let uh, Remick take over for natural areas. Thank you, Anna, that was great. Let me get organized here. Okay, so if it wasn't for Anna and the great fuel pantry collaboration, um, I wouldn't be sharing today or talking about this, but I'll just give you a brief overview. Here are the natural areas on campus. This is a campus map. There's the ecological study area, the Russell Kirk Prairie and the Hodnot Sanctuary. And you can see that that blue bubble is where the fuel garden is located. Um, so it kind of connects in with the prairie. Here's an overview. So you can kind of, this is an older picture, but now there's currently a garden where there used to be turf grass. Um, and Anna showed you a couple of pictures of those. Uh, just to give you a brief overview, we encourage desirable plants like that pale purple comb flower in the middle there, perennial native plants that come from within uh, a certain geographic range of this area. Um, and, we, and we do so by performing ecological restoration duties such as prescribed burning, weeding, cutting invasive brush, spreading seeds. Um, what's become really interesting in recent years uh, this species, for instance, is pasture rose, Rosa palustris. This is its beautiful flower, and this is its fruit. Um, and Anna showed you uh, the picture of the fundraiser that we had by selling the tea. So we harvest the rose hips, we grind it up, put it in tea bags, and people can steep it. And from it, they can get a lot of nutritious value. Um, and this, this has two benefits. So it helps feed the community, it helps give the community nutrition, but it also helps weed out a plant that while it's native, it tends to be invasive. So it's something that, um, that helps in two ways. Uh, another species, another example of that you might've heard of is uh, wild bergamot or Eastern bee balm. Um, this is a very similar genetically to Earl Grey tea. If you've ever had Earl Grey tea, so um, Anna took all these pictures, but we'll harvest the flower, dry it out. Uh, well, the leaves usually, but the flower can also be harvested. Dry it out, steep it in tea, and we can provide tea from the natural areas. And again, while it isn't a native plant, a desirable plant, it does tend to be invasive. So it's, it's okay to, to take it out. Um, recently, there's been discussion. This, this flower right here uh, is plentiful. Anyone who's familiar with natural areas knows that common goldenrod or Canadian goldenrod is everywhere, Saladago canadensis. Uh, historically, American Indians used its yellow flower for dye. So we'd love, we'd love to collaborate, try to harvest it and use it to dye rope or other sorts of things for, for art uses. So that's an exciting development. Another species that exists on the, in the nat, within the natural areas is elderberry, Sambucus canadensis. Um, here are pictures of its distinct bark distinct flowers, distinct form, and distinct berries. Um, from its berries, you can make all sorts of things. While we, we've only made uh, a couple things, we've only kind of steeped it in water and things like that. Um, we're hoping to expand our efforts, really harvest the berries on time as, as we move forward with this project and try to make some baked uh, goods out of it. People have also made wine and spirits out of it. I don't know how far we're gonna go down that road, but um, we can potentially make some tea, medicine. There are plenty of uses for this. It's very popular in Europe. Um, you might've used it when you had a cold. Um, and these are things that are native to the area. They're native to Illinois and they're within our natural preserves. Um, and last but not least, as far as what's on campus, we do have honeybee hives. Now I will state that honeybees are not a native bee. Um, but they do really important um, pollination tasks. The pollination that they do is very important as we've all 
probably heard. Um, so we want to do our part to keep it up. And um, there's a picture of the sign uh, for the honey. Now, while we, we don't have enough quite yet to be selling it, we hope to soon in the um, in the uh, bookstore or things of that nature and have the proceeds go back to the food security efforts. So that's what I have. And I will send it back to the next person here. Thank you so much, Anna and Remick. Um, it's amazing that all that has grown right here in DuPage County on our very own campus. Um, okay, so last but absolutely not least, we are going to turn this discussion over to Shafali Chavetti, and she will provide the most impactful ways to support food pantries. As the executive director of the county's volunteer center, Shafali Trevetti has helped giving DuPage increase volunteer engagement by 250% via their volunteer portal site and initiated the DuPage nonprofit conference and launched Do Good DuPage. Welcome. Thank you so much for this wonderful opportunity to share. And I'm just blown away by, I'm so moved by the work that's happened in this past year and how amazing um, it is that in our DuPage community, people can work so collaboratively to address the needs um, during a global pandemic and always. So um, just as a bystander, I'm thanking you all for your um, inspirational work and for everything you do every day to feed, feed um, those uh, food insecure populations and support our community in the ways that they need it. Um, for those who may not be familiar with Giving DuPage, we serve as the DuPage County Volunteer Center. Our role and our mission is to connect people who want to do good with volunteering and giving back and connecting them to organizations countywide in every cause area and how, to, how they can go about giving back and volunteering their time. So I want to share two quick screens and pieces of information with you. Uh, can I just verify, because I'm working off of two screens, I want to make sure, are you seeing the volunteer portal screen on your end? Okay, great, thank you. So um, many people are unaware that we, as Giving DuPage, host an entire website um, dedicated to volunteering in DuPage County, and we call it the volunteer portal, and essentially it is used by almost 400 local nonprofit organizations to promote their volunteer and in-kind donation needs. Over almost 800 needs are posted at the website um, at any given time. And so this is kind of what you would see if you landed on the website. And I can share the link with you in the chat. Um, and also I think we can share it on the COD pages afterwards. But this um, particular link is already available um, on some pages at the COD website. But when you land at the volunteer portal, you will see immediately just some volunteer needs that were added, like, hey, host a team registration drive or help a preteen celebrate their birthday or um, let's foster some cats. Um, so all sorts of needs. There's a great variety. And there are also um, volunteer needs as well as donation of in-kind um, items that are needed. Um, nonprofit jobs are also posted at the website as well as events that are coming up for organizations. Um, so if you just clicked on, oh, I don't know, I'll just pick on one that says social media super fan. The YWCA is looking for a social media super fan. And you can learn a little bit more about that volunteer opportunity and the organization, and you can respond here electronically. Um, you can also sign up or, or create a login, um, username and login at the portal. And what I want to do is show folks how they can sort through opportunities to search for things. So let's say I just want to search for a keyword pantry and hit the search button. I can see different pantries that will pop up. I can instead search by distance from a zip code. So if I want to search from a distance of five miles by Wheaton zip code or Glen Ellen zip code, how would I do Glen Ellen's 60137? and I just hit a search button, I'll see all the needs that pop up within a distance. I can do multiple filters for interest. For example, I can do interest and I can say, hey, I'm interested in food prep volunteering and all of those will come up. Similarly, you can search organizations in a certain way. So again, on the left navigation, if you clicked on the organizations tab, you could search organizations by keywords or phrases you can search them by a partial name you might have. You can search by distance from a zip code. And again, by cause, which is really important. 
So again, if I click cause, and I don't know, I might find um, disaster response as something. So I'll pull up all those that are doing disaster response. Once you are on an organization's page, and I'll pick PRC uh, with Christina here. If you're on a certain page, you can read about the organization, who they are, and what they do. And I'm going to actually just zoom in on this a little bit, because sometimes when you're watching something on Zoom, you can't see it as well. So here you go, who you are and what you do and opportunities to connect with them. Obviously, you can learn the name of the organization and all the different cause areas that they impact. You can have their contact information and how to reach out to an individual there via email or phone call, their location, as well as their website and any social media links that they might share. Some organizations have also shared for example, their photos and their videos, it's entirely up to them. Again, over almost 400 organizations are utilizing this website. And on any given day, we are making about five um, connections between somebody who wants to do some good and a place to do that. So uh, what would help is for folks to share this resource and how you can volunteer. And in particular, you also heard about um, different ways to give. And we have a great event coming up called Giving to Page Chase. But um, if you have any questions about the volunteer portal, let us know. I'll check the chat in a second. And I'll also, again, put the link in the chat. But the website is givingdupage.org backslash volunteer. And that's how you can get straight to the volunteer portal and start learning about the different volunteer needs. There's such a variety of needs. I'm going to switch gears just a little bit to talk about how you can help with a big event that we have coming up called Giving DuPage Days. So I'm gonna click on that website. Um, again, I'll share the URL in the chat. Can you see the screen here, Stephanie or someone? Just give me, okay, great. So this particular event is a um, online community fundraiser that we started last year. This year is our second year. And essentially it is a multi-charity fundraiser. It's a way to help many, many, many organizations all in one event. Um, this year, there are over 100 local nonprofit organizations, 104 to be exact, who are participating as charities in Giving to Page Days. It's a five-day online fundraiser, and we have a goal to raise over $300,000 for these 104 charities. You can actually start seeing some of the awesome organizations by flipping through. You can click on View All and see all of them. There's five pages of them. You can search by name or location or by a cause. Or we also have in the menu on the right-hand side, the little drop-down menu, we have a list of all the participating charities in one place, just so you can see them um, by name as well. Once again, People's Resource Center is listed here, but so are many, many other pantries um, throughout DuPage County. So again, if you want to just search by cause, you can just go into here and search under, um, I think it was under emergency response that we have, um, emergency response that we have a lot of the food pantries listed. Oh, and poverty and hunger. So I'm going to click on that. This is a great way for you to see all the different pantries that are involved and food um, assistance programs that are involved with this event in one event. Um, and this is just a subset of those organizations. And then lastly, I wanna share on this same website, again, in the menu, if you see Get Involved Top 10 Ways, these are top 10 ways to get involved with this event that do not actually um, require you to donate even a penny just yet. These are ways to get involved right now, um, about 40 days in advance of this event. And the whole idea is that um, obviously because it's an online event and we want thousands of people to donate, we need tens of thousands of amazing outreach angels who will help us spread the word. So there are many easy things you can do from changing your social media cover photo to swapping out your email signature badge to sharing on social networks. We've provided images and ways to share gifts. Um, you can join the events on Facebook and LinkedIn. Uh, you can share a, a signage that says my favorite charity is and I give because. Um, there are I will give pledge cards and more ways to connect to this event. So I'm going to go ahead and share those um, URLs in the chat space. Um, but those are the main ways that I think people can get involved and get connected, especially to support um, all of the food pantries and food assistance programs that happen countywide. 
our volunteer portal for volunteering and this event, which takes place April 26th to the 30th, five days, the last five days of April, um, coming up in just 40 days. So I'll go ahead and share those links and stop sharing my screen and put in the website, um, put in the chat, those other um, features. Thank you so much, Safali. And I'm sure those um, websites will also go on our COD web pages for sure, for those that want to look back at that as well. Um, I want to thank all of our panelists for spending time tonight with us and really sharing this really, really important information with our community. Um, I am going to open, oh, I see your chat. I'm gonna open up the discussion for questions. And so I'll be kind of looking back and forth at our Q and A's here. Okay. As I pose the question, you know, any of the panelists can feel free to answer. And if I step into SNS question, and you're just done, just let me know. All right, so first question here. Um, you know, we've all referenced and you've all referenced that, you know, the, your organizations have had to make many adaptations um, and implement many adaptations to meet the needs since COVID-19. How long after the pandemic, whenever that is, do you see the need re remaining higher than quote unquote, what normally would be? Um, I'll speak on behalf of PRC. There are so many different factors at play. <laughs> so I think looking as we continue to watch the unemployment rate, as we continue to watch what the stimulus funds do, what other additional like through the CARES Act and the funding, especially on a standpoint of homeless prevention, um, I, I think the eviction moratorium, I could go on and on and on. So I think there's so many factors at play that are going to make that need fluctuate over time. Um, so I think we're doing our best to keep a good pulse on as many of those factors that we can pinpoint and then a continue. I think our biggest thing is we want to open up, you know, as we can safely do so, the capacity to serve more at different hours, again, making sure we're creating access where access is needed most. So it's that constant reevaluation of community <laughs> needs and then adapting as we go. So we're kind of in that next iteration um, and then we'll continue to learn and adapt thereafter. So to put any harder, finer point on that at this, at, is, there's just too much that remains to be seen. So we're, we're taking it moment by moment. Okay, thank you. All right, next question here. Is there any collaboration with Sustain DuPage and the Fuel Garden site? I was just typing actually to answer oh, that. What I, I do see say, that you're typing. <laughs> <laughs> what I will say is that with the natural areas, um, I've we've worked with Andrew and Sustain DuPage to donate uh, Buckthorn, which is an invasive brush to make fencing and willow trees, new growth willow trees that he strips and helps make basket uh, weaving with in addition to um, donating seeds, woodland seeds and prairie seeds for their kind of natural areas. And then I'll hand it over to Anna. I know that, and they've been talking about specifically garden collaborations as well. Yeah, we have been talking about um, some garden collaborations coming up in the in the future, hopefully. Uh, it's we're, They're definitely on our radar. We'd love to collaborate more with Sustain DuPage. Okay, great, thank you. And I believe this is another question potentially for the both yes. of you. Um, what would be considered a unique client? Anna, I think that might be for you. A unique client? Um, yeah. I, I'm not sure like uh, what okay. they're referring to actually. Oh, the stats. That just means a new person. Uh, oh, a new so, person, yeah. yes. A new not person. the same. So the same person a lot of times will come every week. Yes. To the food so pantry. We have a lot of people who are, since we started, there's been a lot of new clients. So a unique client is a new client. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, next question. Food allergies and other food needs and or limitations are more prevalent than ever today. This, have ha this has had to be a challenge for a lot of your organizations. Um, how have your community food organizations addressed food allergies as well as the safety of the food recipients and how challenging has that been for you? Oh, that's been incredibly challenging. I mean, we went from a full 100% choice in-person shopping model 
all that stop, forced to curbside. I mean, really taking a step back with this prepacked box that we've worked so hard to move far beyond. So within that, you know, we were working quickly. I had mentioned um, we had added and we're testing because of the high volume of people we were serving, how could we still um, accommodate special needs? So during our standard shifts, we at least try to assess for like um, any food allergies. So we really try to do our best to remove those and make sure that doesn't happen. Gluten-free is a very common need. So we do separate that set of products that are gluten-free and try to accommodate um, and, and diabetes, some of those um, health conditions, we try to you know respond that across all of our distributions. On our specific, and it's a Wednesday distribution, a Thursday distribution, those are where we have a shopping list that a client gets. Again, this is still curbside. They can select and kind of even if they have really special needs that if that if we can't accommodate during those other busier shifts, that's what we recommend to kind of, you know, still be able to accommodate. Um, another thing is with meat. Um, we had to make sure across all distributions, pork and, and for religious cultural reasons. Um, so we made sure that we had a way to adapt and respond to that. Um, so it's things like that. Um, it, child, you know, for infants and uh, baby food and some of those things. Um, but, you know, that's where we're looking now based on everything we've learned. How can we do more around choice, um, given the fact that we know for, for a bit here, we're going to continue to be curbside, but we, we've got to find, use our creativity of how can we kind of open that choice piece back up again, um, even with our current limitations. But as you can imagine, that's, it's been very challenging to meet all those various um, diverse needs. I would say in the school districts that um, every school district is different in how they address this. They do have requirements and they try and meet them. But with all of the changes, they, you know, they also are trying to accommodate so many different needs as well. So really just the food service personnel are really trying to adjust to the new foods that they have to provide in a different way. So um, I would say every school district is doing it in a different way, but sort of in the same way, right, that they have gone about before, but they just have different foods now that they have to sort through. And of course, you're also getting new clients who you've never had before that also may have, or new students, clients really isn't the right term, but new students who really haven't had, you know, maybe that particular allergy before. So you're also now getting new allergies on your list of things to avoid. So it's, you know, it's a, in motion, constant thing, I think, changing for people with those needs. That has to be a huge challenge. Just every person with a food limitation is unique and as well as all those school districts. So um, I can imagine, actually, I can't imagine it would be a huge challenge, but to accommodate everyone. Okay, next question here. Um, I believe there is a high rate of poverty among female headed households. Is it still true that women suffer more from poverty and are there ways to help here at COD and or locally in DuPage County? Well, I will just confirm that, that yes, indeed. And unfortunately, uh, poverty still is uh, persistent and at a higher rate among women than among men. Um, and that's a concern. And it has been like that for a very long time. Unfortunately, as, as I think many people now know that the pandemic has also hurt women in a way that's been very different than men. Uh, women have been the first um, in many cases and in some homes, the first to leave their jobs. Either the job was lower paying or they were the one that was expected to um, take, uh, you know, leave their job, come home, take care of children who are remote schooling, et cetera. Um, I think the statistics can help. Well, this is what statistics always do. They, they, things should happen not according to gender, race, et cetera, right? That some people might lose a job, some people not. When you see something persistent happening, it tells us that structurally we have a problem in our economy, in our uh, society. And so um, I guess I would just answer that with an emphatic, yes, we need to do something about this. It is persistent and it is not going away unless we take substantial steps. Um, I obviously, from a political science perspective, would advocate for policy solutions and um, 
you know, taking a look at a ways in which we can um, look at the gender pay gap um, that would help us increasing minimum wage when women work, uh, you know, um, jobs that sometimes pay less, et cetera. Um, but I'll leave it to the others to talk about the more direct service um, angle of that question. I don't know if this helps. Sorry, go ahead, Janet. I was just going to say, I don't know if this helps, but just knowing that the, um, the aid that's coming through next, which I haven't seen all of it, I mean, a lot of it will be targeted for, you know, women just because they fall into the categories, right? All the categories will be ad being addressed and they will hit women with children, families of low income. So, um, you know, I, yes, it's a, you can see, like you said, that it's a, a prominently female issue, but also we're going to see some of the aid going directly towards those, that particular group from many different angles is what I'm trying to say. Okay, thank you. Okay, I think this would be a question for the fuel garden as well. Um, does COD practice no-till regenerative farming? Um, so all of our garden beds right now are raised garden beds, so we don't till at all. Um, we do amend the soil organically very often between seasons. Uh, so we're constantly adding uh, compost to the garden beds to renew the soil in them. But no, we are not tilling, we are in raised beds. And that's a good segue into the next question that Anna, you could go after. Do we, what happens to fresh food or veggies that aren't distributed? We don't have, right now we run out within like about the first 15 to 20 minutes. We haven't had any extras. But whatever extras of the employees or friends of the employees or family uh, goes into the compost bin, and then it's composted and then we amend the soil with it. So it's yes, a, if there are any extras or if anything does spoil, it does get added back into the compost and it is used to feed the next crop basically. So we're constantly renewing the garden soil, amending the garden soil so that we can get like as big a harvest uh, as possible. And it's worth noting that Anna really helped get going this these efforts. But for instance, before the campus was closed, the Subway restaurant on campus um, donated its extra veggie pieces to the compost. Yes. Um, so yeah, before it shut down, we were uh, picking up uh, from Subway uh, every, like about uh, every week, uh, all their extra veggie scraps. And we used those to uh, add to the vegetable beds and composted them. We also took all the coffee grounds from the on-campus Starbucks daily. So that was quite a lot when it was running to amend the garden soil. So we've been feeding our soil constantly um, to make sure that our 13 beds are, are producing as much as possible. Okay, great, thank you. Shafali, I believe this is a question for you. So you mentioned um, how you know, individuals can get involved with volunteering. How does an organization get linked with your volunteer portal? Um, that is a good question and a simple one for me to answer. There are two sort of ways. Um, first, just to verify that you are a DuPage based organization or that you're an organization, if you're just sort of right outside of DuPage, but you're serving DuPage County residents, that's really the only qualification. And um, then at the sign up link, um, there's a sign up as a user, and then there's also a sign up as an organization. And so you just fill out that sign up as an organization and complete the form. It's straightforward. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, I have one, let me just check the Q&A. I believe I have one more question here. Okay, big question. All right, so we know that adequate nutrition leads to an overall healthier life and healthier lives lead to less disease and then ultimately less healthcare needs. And then therefore, ideally everyone should have easy access to nutritionally dense food. Do you feel that the concept of adequate nutrition can become affordable, sustainable, and universal overall? And what can we do as a society to lead to move towards those efforts? So that's a great question. I'll just start and then if anybody else wants to say it in, but um, I, I, there was during, I think it was, um, might have been in the 50s, 60s, there was this. Um, concern globally that we didn't we wouldn't have enough food to feed all of us and that is population was rising 
you know, the theories were that we would just wouldn't be able to. And then with all of the new technologies that were created in terms of agricultural production, those worries just went away because we now do have um, sufficient uh, means to feed um, the, those on our globe. Um, and that's a big deal that we went from these really this scare, this point of being scared that we couldn't to that we could. So as um, when people talk about famines, they will often say famine is a political problem. This is why in political science we talk about and with our students that um, it, it, the, there are solutions, um, but there, it's not easy because it takes some coming together of a community. This is why this event is so terrific to have so many different angles of people. Um, and I think uh, as the person who asked the question brought up that um, there's a lot of will to, to feed people and to uh, make it um, accessible, especially when children are young, where the, the risks are highest in terms of um, uh, optimal brain development, learning potential, et cetera. Um, so I, I think it's a, a matter of raising some consciousness, putting out some concrete solutions, um, um, but that yes, uh, the, and, and, and if, 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 if only for a self-interested point of view as a community, it helps with economic growth. If we feed everybody and educate everybody well, we grow, we grow as a community. So um, I, I personally would say from a moral standpoint, we can figure out how to, to do this. Um, from an economic standpoint, it makes sense. From a political standpoint, it's tricky, but doable. Thank you. Okay, I'm gonna do just a time check here. Joan, that was our last question, our Q&A. Okay, all right, thank you. All right, so I'll be um, closing tonight's discussion. And so this concludes our presentation this evening. Make sure I'm not on mute there. Um, we are so grateful for the work being done to alleviate food insecurity among our students, our neighbors, and our community. We are also inspired to help those in need. Dialogue Over Distance organizers would like to thank all of our panelists. Janet Milliken, Maureen heffern Panicky, Christina LePage, Anna Vitek, Remick Ensweiler, and Shafali Trevedi for sharing their time and expertise with us this evening. Also, thank you so much to all of our virtual participants, and we thank you for spending time out of your busy schedules to be with us here tonight for this very important topic. We hope this Dialogue Over Distance presentation inspires action. Food pantries have a consistent need for nutritious and fresh foods to distribute. And here are a few ways that you can help. Take advantage of buy one, get one specials or deals next time you are shopping. Plant a little extra this spring and share fresh produce from your garden. Volunteer at a food bank near you. Thank food bank workers. And for more ideas, please visit www.cod.edu backslash experts. We hope you will join us for some upcoming virtual events presented by the College of DuPage. On Tuesday, April 13th, hear life-changing stories and ways you can be a part of that story during a discussion on blood, organ, and tissue donation to save and heal. On Thursday, April 29th, we will examine mental, emotional, and physical benefits of proper shelter in housing is healthcare. Both of these webinars will begin at 7 p.m. Thank you so much and good night.